Hi, how are you today? I hope your week is off to a great start. Welcome to Crime Dive. My name is Crystal Skye, and if you're anything like me, you find yourself drawn to true crime cases. So yeah, that's what I talk about. If you like true crime and you want to feel better about your makeup skills, you should absolutely like, subscribe, and come hang out with me every Tuesday where I take a deep dive look into a true crime case while slapping on my face. Uh, yeah, so we hit over 100 subscribers, which I know is not, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I know, like, that's not a whole lot. But for me, it's, it's a, a whole lot. I never thought in a million years that anyone other than my, you know, family and friends would want to watch these videos. Um, I started this after, you know, binging the queen, Bailey Saren. And I also love, love, love Danielle Kirsty. Those two are like my all-time faves. And they really is are what inspired me to make this channel and kind of make it as like sort of a reel of sorts, you know, to keep up with my production skills. And I just thought, hey, like what a cool creative way to not just make a reel, but kind of force myself out of my out of my comfort zone, you know, because I'm very much a behind the camera type of gal, you know. So yeah, thank you so, so much for subscribing and checking me out. I, I truly appreciate it. Okay, well, uh, let's, let's, let's get into why we're all here, right? It's today's case. Now, today's case is uh, what I'm calling a Hollywood homicide case. I know, totes original, I know. Uh, the only other one I have done thus far is the one on Phil Hartman. It was one of the first ones that I did. And I wanted to do some more because you know, my degree is in production. I've always been fascinated with the industry and filmmaking. I've always been drawn to true crime stories. And so, of course, when you mix those two, of course, I'm going to be interested in those as well. Now, today's case, even though it doesn't involve a celebrity directly, it involves the son of a celebrity, the son of an Academy Award winning actress. And this story, I read about it and I was just completely floored. I had never really heard about this case. So yeah, wanted to talk about it. Today, we will be discussing John Markle, who murdered his entire family and blamed his mother for it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. Disclaimer wise, I think you're, I think you're okay. There's nothing too gruesome or graphic, just, you know, heartbreaking and sad because we are talking about the loss of human lives. So yeah, without further ado, let's get into today's case. So John Markle, John Lawrence Michael, he was born early Christmas day. That's right, December 25th, 1941. And he was born in Hollywood, California. And he was, he was born to some pretty, you know, pr prestigious, Hollywood players. His father was William Fifield, who was an American author, essayist, and like short story writer. And in fact, in 1943, he won the O. Henry Award for one of his short stories. And yeah, he was a pretty prominent uh, author. John's mother was Academy Award winning actress Mercedes McCambridge. Now she was actually a radio actress. And so she had been in the industry for a while, and she knew some pretty popular, powerful people in the industry, including Orson Welles. He was actually a good friend of hers, and it is said that he is the he is the one who talked her into transitioning to film appearances when radio was sort of on the decline, you know, and, and film was taking off. It is said Orson Welles talked Mercedes into transitioning to film. Now, William and Mercedes, they were not together too long. The couple divorced in 1946. And in 1950, Mercedes would marry her second husband. And this was Canadian actor, screenwriter, producer, director, Fletcher Markle. And he had come from Canada and, yeah, was now in Hollywood. And they married in 1950. And Fletcher would actually go on to adopt John. And that is where John picked up the Markle last name. Now, John was described as being a pretty bright, intelligent young boy. But it is said that 
his his home life and his domestic situation was pretty uneven, which you can imagine, right? Busy, popular actress. Like, yeah, of course, it's probably not going to be the best upbringing. I mean, truly, there's worse upbringings, but yeah, definitely not going to be the best. And it is said that, yeah, it was pretty uneven and Mercedes wasn't really around a whole lot. William, John's father, I think he pretty much disappeared from John's life after he divorced Mercedes. Cause I was looking up a little bit into his background and it barely mentioned John. So I tried to find out a little bit about John's relationship with Fletcher, his stepfather, but couldn't find too much there. There wasn't a whole lot of detailed, you know, nitty gritty details that I could find, but yeah, it must've been close enough because Fletcher did adopt John and give him his name. So now, when John was only eight years old, this is when Mercedes would win her Academy Award. It was for Best Supporting Actress for the film All the King's Men, which was released in 1949, and it actually won Best Picture that year as well. So it was it was a pretty big movie for its time. And I read another source that said Mercedes, like, this was her first big screen debut. Like This was her big screen first big screen film appearance and yeah, gets an Academy Award right off the bat. Fletcher and Mercedes would end up divorced in 1962. And I tried to find out a little bit more about uh, John's upbringing and, and childhood and all that. Couldn't find too much information. There are a few things though, uh, such as that he did go ahead and earn his master's degree in economics at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. And he graduated, like I said, with his master's in 1968. And later in July of that same year, he married his girlfriend, Christine Mole. Now, I tried finding out, again, information about Christine and her and John's relationship, how they met. I just couldn't really find anything. Just, you know, just those kind of details about, you know, his education and when they married. John would continue with his graduate studies and in 1972, he got a job at Solomon Brothers in Dallas, Texas. In the same year when he moves to Texas for Solomon Brothers, the same year Mercedes was actually nominated for a Tony Award. It was for her role in The Love Suicide at Schofield Barracks. And the next year, in 1973, John would go on to earn his PhD again from UCLA. And Mercedes had a revival in her career around this time when she voiced the demon in The Exorcist, which of course was a huge smash. So that sort of reignited her career a little bit and sort of introduced her to sort of a new generation of audience goers. On March 16th, 1973, Christine and John welcomed their first child, a daughter they named Amy Michelle. And on February 8th, 1978, the couple would welcome their second child, another daughter they named Suzanne Marie. Now, a little over a year after Suzanne is born in March of 1979, this is when the family, the Markles, they relocate to Little Rock, Arkansas. John took a job at a well-known New York invest firm, and it was called Stevens Incorporated. And John was hired on as an economist and a futures trader there. Now, Stevens, it was, it was a pretty, pretty well-to-do firm. It was the 15th largest investment firm in the country. So pretty big deal. Now, I'm about to say a lot of fancy smancy financial economic terms. No, I don't know what they mean because I tried even getting just a layman's term definition and I just was struggling. I'm not interested in finance and all that stuff. So yeah, I'm just gonna repeat to you what I read in my sources. John's job responsibilities included monitoring movements in the esoteric futures market. And no, not too sure what that means. Like I said, I tried to find like a layman's term, dumbed down definition, and <laughs> there was just none. So yeah, but that those were his job responsibilities. And he was really good at his job. And he was actually entrusted so much with his job. Like he was so good at it. He was entrusted with the personal accounts with the founders of Stevens, which were a couple of brothers. They were Jackson, Jack T, and W.R. Witt Stevens. Oh, excuse me, W.R. Witt Stevens. And they had actually been named on the Forbes 400 Richest Americans list. So they were pretty rich, powerful guys. And yeah, John was entrusted with their personal accounts. He was also entrusted with the account of his mother, Mercedes. Now, after only eight months at Stevens, right? Eight months, less than a year, John had shot 
all the way up to vice president. And not just that, he answered to no one except for maybe Jack Stevens himself. Yeah, he had a lot of leeway, a lot of pull, was entrusted with large amounts of money, and yeah, had a really prestigious reputation as far as knowing, you know, how these markets work and stuff like that. And it is said that his early work for the firm was nothing short of exceptional. He generated $3 million in profits in his first three years with the firm. And like I said, the only other, the only person that John even answered to was the Stevens brothers. And even Jack Stevens would later admit that he wasn't even quite too sure about the type of futures trading that John was involved with. Now, over his time with the firm, John and the Stevens brothers, they formed a pretty close relationship. It is said that they, you know, really liked and respected each other. And John was actually one of the most respected men in the market. And in fact, on July 30th, 1985, John made what was believed to be the first international trade of listed U.S. government securities. And... No, not quite sure what that means either, but it was a pretty big deal and such a big deal. Forbes actually did an article on John and I did read parts of this article and I did find some photos of like the article spread. And in the article, John was boasting about how much sway and authority he had in his job, how he didn't really have to answer to anybody. He bragged about how he could put $800 million on the line without going through a committee. He had that much autonomy at his job. He was that well respected. And, you know, he was already generating profits in his first three years there. So yeah, it seemed that he was kind of backing up what he was boasting about. They said John had a pessimistic view of the American economy, and this earned him the nickname Dr. Doom, not to be confused with the Fantastic Four Dr. Doom. Now, John had his best trading success in the early 1980s when interest rates were on the rise. That was when he had, like, I guess, the, the best performance of his career. And it seems the Markles made Little Rock their home. This is where they kind of put down their roots. Friends said that John was very determined to give his children a very happy upbringing, a very optimistic, bright childhood, because he said that his wasn't really that great. Despite growing up, you know, with wealth and privilege, he said that he did not have a very happy, satisfying childhood, and he was determined to do right by his daughters. And uh, in fact, it seems uh, John's relationship with Mercedes was pretty complicated and nuanced and complex, to say the least. In 1981, long since divorced, Mercedes actually moved out to Little Rock in order to be near John and her family, and she moved out to what was known as the Quapaw Towers. But she still did some acting. In 1986, she was actually in a production with the Arkansas Repertory Theater. She played the mother of a suicidal daughter in Night Mother. So yeah, those are the Markles. They've settled down in Little Rock. And yeah, we've got we've got John Markle here, who's pretty an interesting, interesting character. So friends talked about what a sweet, caring, devoted family man John was, how de devoted he was, even, even if he may have been a little pessimistic in nature. But co-workers, they got a different John. They, they saw a different John Markle than what his friends and family saw. Co-workers described John as rude, temperamental, and socially inept. Uh, I guess he threatened a co-worker one time with an AK-47 and then one time showed up to work with his gun arsenal in his trunk because John did collect guns and he did have a myriad of weapons. And yeah, he had packed them into his trunk and shown up at work to prove that he could make do with his threat. So yeah, I wouldn't want to work with that guy. John was also described as, we'll say eccentric. You know, he had, he had little, little quirks, little eccentricities that co-workers couldn't help but notice. So Remember, John is a futures trader, very Wall Streety, you know, very white collar. So you would expect suits and, and ties and you know that that kind of thing, right? Well, John, when he did wear suits and ties, they were usually like rumpled and, and wrinkled, and more often than not, he would actually wear his Harley Davidson cap. 
Yeah, he had a Harley Davidson cap. And he would actually wear it when he was trading. And he would always do this, apparently. And allegedly, he made his assistant wear a specific type of hat when he was trading as well. I don't know what kind of hat, but yeah, that's what the sources were saying. So he had these weird little quirks. He was known for wearing like white socks and purple shoes. And again, this is on top of like his rumpled up business suits and stuff. And even though he had a really nice Lincoln car, I guess John would show up in either his Harley Davidson motorcycle or in this like old beater of a pickup truck that him and his daughters had painted an array of bright, bold colors. And he would show up to, you know, his white collar job in this. So yeah, he was also known to work really long erratic hours. More than once, co-workers saw him sleeping on the bench that was outside of the offices. So that was John. Christine, meanwhile, it seemed that, you know, she was the, you know, ever-loving, ever-devoted housewife and mother. It said that she was involved in Girl Scouts and other activities that her daughters were involved in. Amy, the oldest daughter, she was in the eighth grade, and she attended Man Magnet School. And friends described her as a very excellent student, and she had aspirations of being a dancer. She had taken dance lessons, I think, since she had been really little, and she just had a passion for dance, and that is what she wanted to do with her life. In fact, she had planned to apply to the School of Arts in Minneapolis. And Suzanne, the younger sister, she was in fourth grade, and she went to Gibbs Magnet School. And she was described as just idolizing her big sister. So she also took dance lessons, like ballet and stuff, because she wanted to be just like her big sister. And yeah, that was the Markle family. It, it seemed from all outward appearances that they were, you know, the picture-perfect-esque, average, upper-middle-class family, you know? But as we will get into, that's, that's not, that's really not how it's really going down behind closed doors. Now, though the family was involved in lots of activities and they did have friends and ties to the community, friends and, and those in the community couldn't help but notice that the Markles kind of kept to themselves. They were kind of private. They didn't really, they didn't really like talk a whole lot, like outwardly about themselves. And in 1986, the first crack would appear in this picture perfect happy family. In 1986, John was arrested on solicitation of a sex worker. Now, the charge was ultimately dropped, and he ended up pleading guilty to public intoxication. This wasn't the only behavior that John exhibited that sort of clashed with this, you know, persona that he was presenting to the world. Apparently, he also really, really liked to smoke uh, what Bailey calls, you know, the devil's lettuce. Uh, he, he loved to smoke marijuana, had a very, very, I guess, healthy marijuana habit. And in fact... It would later be found out that John cashed three to four checks, totaling between $600 and $1,000 a week. And no one knows what this money was for, what it was spent on. And it is theorized that it was spent on John's marijuana habit. And John also smoked cigarettes quite heavily. He was a very heavy smoker altogether. And this, coupled with his very high stress job, led John to having major heart surgery when he was only 43 years old. He had to have a sex tuple heart bypass surgery. Yeah, pretty big deal. He was only 43 years old. Now, on the evening of November 16th, 1987, there were a lot of thunderstorms raging in the area. They had knocked down power lines and trees and it was just, it was just a really bad storm. And Christine, who was 45 years old at this time, Amy, who was 13, and Suzanne, who was nine, they're all asleep in the Markle household on the second and third floor floors. At 2.30 a.m., John Markle, he's the only one awake, and he proceeds to put on a very creepy Halloween mask. It was like an old man mask. It was like bald and had like a hooked nose and, and bushy eyebrows and like a gross like mustache, like beard thing. It, it's a pretty creepy, creepy mask. And he proceeds to put this mask on. He walks upstairs to the second and third floor bedrooms and proceeds to methodically kill his wife and two daughters. 
After John was done, he went down to the first floor into a study and he called his lawyer, a man by the name of Richard Lawrence. And he told Richard to come over before he just hung up. Now, Richard tried to call John back twice with no answer before he left his house to go to John's house. But before he left his own house, he did call the local police station and he did ask the dispatcher to send an officer to accompany him. He, you know, laid down the situation and asked for an officer to meet him there. Now, the thunderstorms, like I said, they had knocked out power lines and trees and they had also knocked out radio transmissions. And it is thought that that is the reason why when Richard pulled up to the Markle residence, there was no cop. There was no cop to assist, but he saw a couple of squad cars sitting in the parking lot of the nearby Safeway. And so he went over there, explained the situation, and one of the officers then accompanied him to John's house. Both Richard and the officer arrived at John's house on the porch at approximately 4.15 a.m. And they noticed that the house was completely dark, except for a light that they saw on the first floor. They also saw that the front door was ajar. And that is when the officer, you know, stepped in first and walked towards the light. It was in John's study. And in his study, they found John Markle dead from suicide. He had two bullet wounds on either side of his head. Lying beside him were two guns, a 38 Colt revolver. I read other reports that said it was a 45 caliber. And there was also a Charter Arms 38 caliber gun found, or revolver, I guess I should say. And they also found the blood spattered Halloween mask. And it was like all rolled up as if he had just like pulled it off. And apparently after calling Richard, John had put both of these guns to either side of his head and pulled the trigger, killing himself. On the desk next to him and next to his hearing aid was a glass of Cuddy Sark, which was like a blended scotch whiskey. There was also a suicide note dated. Um, it was dated 11-16-1987, 2.30 a.m., the date and time that he butchered his family. In the suicide note, which was in John's handwriting, he wrote, quote, let it hereby be stated as true that I, John L. Markle, murdered my wife and two children, Amy and Suzanne, then committed suicide myself. My wife had no knowledge or part in this. I think the evidence shall so provide. Another 38 caliber Colt revolver, I guess, was found in a second floor bathroom, but it had not been used in the murders. And ultimately, police would find quite a few guns in the Markle home. They would seize 18 weapons from the residence. Like I said, John was a gun collector. On the second floor, there was static heard coming from a playroom. And there was static on a TV playing. And in the VCR was the movie Nightmare on Elm Street. The Markles had rented it in the nights prior. And that kind of led to sort of, you know, with the Halloween mask and now this, this kind of added to like spooky vibes. And they continued on into the second floor and they went into Amy's bedroom. And that is where they found 13-year-old Amy and 9-year-old Suzanne cuddled up together in Amy's canopy bed. They had huddled up together because they were kind of frightened from the thunderstorms in the area because they had been really loud and destructive. And so they had crawled into bed together in order to sleep through it. The pink walls were splattered with their blood. Amy had been shot four times. Suzanne had been shot five. And they had both been shot in the head and chest. It's so sad. I guess earlier that evening, Amy had called a friend and was really excited because John had agreed to take her and this friend skateboarding. And so she was really excited. Christine was found in the third floor in the master bedroom that actually took up the entire third floor. She was strewn across the couple's waterbed and she had been shot three times again in the head and chest. Now traces of the antidepressant Elavil Elavil? E-L-A-V-I-L. -E -L. I've never heard of that antidepressant. Maybe it was more prominent in the 80s. But traces of this antidepressant was found in all of the Markle's systems. And it should be noted, this antidepressant apparently was known to cause heavy drowsiness. Christine and John also tested positive for marijuana and Valium. And John also had a mild appetite suppressant in his stomach, along with a minute amount of that alcohol they found in his study. And neighbors had never heard the gunshots of John killing his family or himself. And it is thought because of the, the thunderstorms that were raging. They were very, very loud. Lots of wind and thunder. This happened at 
2.30 at, in the morning. So yeah, no one even heard the gunshots. Now, in addition to a, a lot of stuff would come out after this whole thing, a lot of dirty secrets that John had been hiding. So in addition to a suicide note, John had also left behind a black briefcase that was found by the front door and it was left to Richard. Inside were several letters and documents, including a couple of letters addressed to Richard, which were marked in the order he was to read them. There was a handwritten will that mentioned neither Christine nor Amy or Suzanne. There was a 12 to 13 page letter to Mercedes, his mother, 64 $100 bills, a $5,000 money order, a spiral notebook, and other assorted papers and documents like titles and birth certificates and stuff. Now, in the letters to both Richard and Mercedes, John expressed his inner turmoil and shame and embarrassment and depression that he had felt from being fired from Stevens. Yes, John was fired. And don't you worry, we will get into that. Yeah, this was a shock to everyone. No one knew that John had been fired from Stevens. They also found diaries that John had kept. And this sort of painted a, a more clear picture of what exactly had happened in the last few months. In a diary entry that was dated October 27th, a couple of weeks before he was to be fired, John wrote, quote, My wife Christine is the greatest woman alive, and my children are the very, very best. Amy got an A in algebra because she knew it would make me happy. Suze is such an upward-looking person. None of these people deserve me. I have put all of their futures in jeopardy. My relationship with my mother has been destroyed. I fear I have placed my family at considerable financial risk, i.e. I am broke. And they, referring to Amy and Suzanne, have no inheritance left because of my actions. Christine says I have put my family last, and I have. There is really only one choice now. There was another entry dated a day later, and it said, quote, I awake depressed, and by Tuesday, this will be three weeks of unresolved chaos. Christine and the children are beginning to feel the pressure. Amy in particular doesn't want to move to Australia or anywhere else. It would later be found out that John, yeah, was planning on moving the family out of country. A few days after the murders, an owner of a typesetting and like resume service, her name was Jane Gordon, and she let authorities know that on November 6th, John Markle had hired her to write him a resume, and he told her that he was going to move his family outside of the United States because it was, quote, not a good environment for my children. He wanted to go to an English-speaking country, and he had decided on Australia because it was the closest to the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Now, the letter addressed to Mercedes, uh, the 12 to 13 page letter, it of course captured media's attention. You know, you've got this Academy Award winning actress. She had just, you know, she had, she was the demon and exorcist. And now her son has just murdered his family before killing himself. And everyone wanted to know, like, what did this letter say? Mercedes tried for a year and a half to get the letter uh, blocked from public view. But unfortunately, in 1989, a state Supreme Court ruled against her. They ordered the letter and other documents related to the case released to the public record. And this had been, yeah, a long, long, drawn-out legal battle that Mercedes had tried so, so hard to win. Now, it should be noted, despite all of the documents and the suicide note, the letter to Mercedes and his attorney, nowhere, nowhere, nowhere does John explain why he killed Christine and his children. You can understand why he would probably be suicidal, depressed for himself, but no one knows why he decided to take his wife and children with him. After reviewing all the like financial documents and all the papers that John had left behind, it was clear that he was trying to put things in order before he committed suicide. And he was trying to make it so that all any of his assets or estate, any money from either of those, would go off to paying the debt that he had to Stevens. Yeah, he owed the firm money. And again, we will get into it, don't you worry. Records would later show that Mercedes in the 
the end, would receive more than half of John's $890,000 estate. So the letter, the letter to Mercedes, all right? So it was released to the public. And in this letter, boy, um, really not a mystery why Mercedes was trying to keep this under wraps because, oh boy, it does not paint Mercedes in the best light. To put it mildly, in this letter, John went off on pretty much what a crappy mother Mercedes was, you know? He vented all of his frustration that he had felt for her. And yeah, it just really gave the public an inside view on what it was like growing up being the son of a popular, busy, working actress. Now, this letter to his mother, it seemed to have been written over the course of several days. There was a diary entry from John's dated on Halloween that had noted he had, quote, just about finished the letter to my mother. So yeah, this, you know, 12 to 13 page letter had been written over the course of several days. And it seemed based on the contents that when he wrote this letter to his mother, he hadn't really planned to kill his family yet. It kind of seemed that he was going off on her and then planning to go no contact with her after, you know, that that's kind of what it read. The only part of the letter that mentioned the murders was the first page of the letter, which people believe was the last page written of the letter. And this uh, first page, which, you know, was actually written last, uh, he wrote it after the plans that he'd had to pay back the debt he owed Stevens after his mother had refused to cooperate with either of those plans, because both plans that he had relied on on her cooperation and she had refused. And so that's when he had finished off the letter. He wrote, quote, and this, this was referring to her refusal to assist in his plans. He wrote, quote, but no, you refused and sent your wires, which by the way, Warren, which was uh, the Stevens brothers' son, mentioned as negative impact on his and his father and his uncle. So you didn't do it, and you played hang up for a week with me, and now Stevens is mad at me and you. And so a deal that would have cost you nothing has now changed in a very different way. I wish you'd never done a lot of the things you've done. Night, mother. And apparently this little night mother was a reference to the role she had played in that one play where she played the mother of a suicidal daughter. He continued on in the letter. You were never around much when I needed you. So now I and my whole family are dead. So you can have the money. Funny how things work out, isn't it? Which is just really funny. Like, so he's pretty much blaming his mother for getting himself in trouble, which again, I will get into. And then pretty much blaming her like, oh, look what you made me do. You made me murder and butcher my family. Like, nah, homeboy, that was all you. Like, look, I'm not saying... We'll get more into it. I'm not saying Mercedes was mother of the year or anything, but, you know, as we say, there are plenty of children who grew up with crappy parents and then they'll go on to murder their entire family, which includes two young children. The second page of the letter to Mercedes, this is where he admits to the embezzlement scheme that he had been operating at Stevens. Yeah, so again, I'm going to get all into that. Yeah, there was an embezzlement scheme at Stevens. And in the second page of the letter, he was admitting to the scheme and uh, letting letting people know and letting her know that she had nothing to do with this. He wrote, quote, guilty. John Markle traded your account on an undisclosed discretionary basis. I added funds to your account. I added losses, losses to the Stevens account. Innocent. You are clearly innocent of any wrongdoing in this matter. I am 100% responsible. And after this part in the letter, John just seems to kind of go in chronologically about his childhood. Again, just sort of going off on Mercedes, venting, letting her know all the pent up frustration and, and anger he had had for her over the decades. He wrote about what it was like, you know, growing up a movie star's son and her not being around a whole lot and, you know, being raised mainly by, you know, relatives or housekeepers or something, nannies. He said, quote, you were clearly a working mother. I was essentially raised by live-in maids and relatives. I was conceptualized to save a bad marriage. I accept the new father. I lose the new father. 
or I lost the new father. I watched you try to kill yourself twice. You have never been there for me when the chips were down. You can certainly see why Mercedes was trying to block this from public view, right? It does not paint her in the best light. John also expressed how he felt guilty for the, her second divorce from her divorce from Fletcher. He wrote about, yeah, just times of, of seeing his mother visibly drunk and how she'd fight with her co-stars. And yeah, she seemed to fight with a lot of her co-stars. And like the whole letter was just peppered with Hollywood references and clear signs that he had grown up this very bizarre Hollywood lifestyle. There were, you know, things like, quote, we were living in the Judy Garland house in Glenroy in West LA. Another one, quote, you and Joan Crawford were both drinking and fighting like hell. Quote, you were filming something with Elizabeth Taylor in London. Like little, little things like this. And yeah, I gotta say, it seemed that Mercedes fought with her co-stars quite a lot. Like, <laughs> He expressed what he felt was indifference that Mercedes had felt for him all of his life. He went on about how he had always tried to impress her and do things that he thought would make her proud to win her affection. Tried winning awards, winning awards in like school and stuff. But his ne mother, quote, never seemed to notice. He mentioned how he had called her daily for 26 years how he had used his boyhood earnings to buy her stuff and, again, you know, just try to impress her. He wrote, quote, what was I trying to buy? He accused her of ruining multiple family functions with her selfishness and her drunkenness and of her impatience of being no help when, you know, the chips were down when he needed it. He accused her of being hard to please. He said, quote, when I cried on the phone, you called me a sniveling wimp that was weakening his position. You threatened suicide once on October 19th and once on October 22nd. Thanks for all your help. And in this particular section when like, yeah, he's going off, re you know, reminiscing about his childhood. I guess he ended a lot of these sections with thanks for all your help and like underlined multiple times, probably to try to emphasize like the sarcasm. Another portion of the letter wrote, quote, is this clear to you that you have hurt every member of my family? that you have hurt me, that I have stood by you under some really adverse conditions, and that you have never done anything but manipulate me for your purpose. I have broken man's law. You have not. I have not broken God's law. You have. There's nothing more to say. Which, again, like I said, I'm not saying Mercedes deserves mother of the year here, but like the gall, the audacity to sit there and butcher your family and then try to blame your mother for it. Like, come on, maybe own up and take some responsibility, bro. Now let's, let's get a little bit into, into some of these secrets that came out, right? Because I kind of, I kind of threw a lot out you. He was fired from Stevens. He had an embezzlement scheme. He had planned that relied on Mercedes cooperation. What? Let's, let's go ahead and get into that. So yeah, like I said, after the murders, it was found out that John had been fired, which floored everyone. No one knew he had been fired. He had been fired on November 13th. Yeah, only three days before the murders. And he had been fired for embezzlement and mismanaging of funds. Mismanagement of funds? That sounds better. So John's decline at Stephen, it started in September of 1987. Stevens, Stevens Incorporation, they had been made aware of a report that had been made by one of the firm's clients, a Ch Chicago securities trading firm called Gelderman Incorporated. So in this report, Gelderman was alleging that John was manipulating a secret account in the name of his mother. Now, apparently, there had been some rumors for quite some time that John, John was doing some like hinky stuff. He was doing some eyebrow raising, weird, kind of like shady stuff. But these rumors had never been pursued due to, you know, John's credibility and the fact that he was frequent, frequently the target of, you know, unflattering rumors and gossip and stuff because he, you know, was kind of a douche to his co-workers. And so, yeah, these rumors were never actually fully pursued or listened to. Now, publicly, Stevens had told the press that they had put John on medical leave on October 7th while they investigated some claims. But as the weeks after the murders passed, the press found out, they found out what had really happened between John Markle and Stevens. So the real reason John had been fired from Stevens was because of financial discrepancies 
and some of the accounts he managed, particularly the accounts belonging to Mercedes and the Stevens brothers. So John would make investments on behalf of accounts without disclosing which accounts these investments were for. You know, he, he didn't he didn't let it be known like which accounts were which. So this is how this is how his little his little scheme went. So he would place an order with Gelderman, right? And wait until the end of the trading day before indicating which account that the order had been for. So when an investment was profitable, he assigned it to his mother's account. And when it was a loss, he assigned it to the Stevens account. I know, weird, right? Like, this guy is supposed to hate his mother so much, but yet he's putting, like, profits in her account. Maybe he thought he was safeguarding his inheritance. I don't know. Now, of course, what John was doing here, this was in direct violation of the Chicago Board of Trade of Trade Rules and against Stevens own like internal policy. This was this was a big no no. Now, the losses for the Stevens account, that in-house account, totaled five point two million dollars with one point three million dollars being lost in the first 10 months of 1987 alone. In fact, 1987 was the worst performing year for the Stevens account. Meanwhile, at the same time, 1987 was a great year for Mercedes accounts. 91.7% of trades for Mercedes account, they were profitable, which apparently this is this is like a record that's like too good to be true. Like this 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 should definitely raise some eyebrows. Now, apparently, there were some at Gelderman. They were aware of John's little scheme and what he was doing. But they turned the other way because John was such a, quote, good customer. Now, it was suspected that John was using this little scheme, this little system of his, before he even got the job at Stevens. So apparently John had a super good friend who actually went to work at Gelderman. And then that good friend ended up going to another Chicago trading firm, Elders Futures Incorporated. And when his friend did that, John moved some of the accounts over to Elders. And this is when John's scheme unravels, begins to unravel. So at Gelderman, all right, all of the account statements, you know, statements for the accounts, John had set it up so that those were mailed directly to his home, to his house. So, you know, Stevens wasn't aware. However, when he moved those accounts to Elders, either he forgot or there was a clerical error or something, but those statements were then sent to Stevens headquarters. And these statements caught the attention of higher ups. And yeah, this is just when it all starts to go downhill for John. He was found out. And there was no evidence found that Mercedes had any knowledge or anything of what John was doing. She was not part of it and she was not aware of it. She assumed that the $604,000 that she had given her son was being invested, you know, safely. She thought that he was managing it into like in safe treasury bills in money markets, not commodity futures, which apparently lose more money than they earn. Now, it was found out that John had actually forged his mother's signature on an application and power of attorney form that John had used to set up and manage the account. So that's how he was able to like open this account with commodity futures and do all that without her knowledge. So again, yeah, maybe he was just trying to set up his own future. I don't know. Now, when Stevens found out all of this and confronted John with what they had found, at first he denied it. But, you know, once once he saw the evidence, you know, they had, he knew the jig was up and he confessed. Now, because John had those past heart issues, that is why it was decided that, you know, publicly and to save face for John, because remember, he's still part of the boys club. So, you know, they would allow him to save face. It was said that he would be placed on medical leave, while in actuality, they would go and see just what John had been up to and what the damage was. And a few days later, his keys and access to company computers were taken and cut off and confiscated. Now, John, he attempted to settle the debt that he had with Stevens by coming up with a couple of plans. The problem is these plans, they they hindered on Mercedes cooperation. She had to she had to work with John. She she he needed her help. And if she didn't agree, these plans wouldn't work. So one of these plans, right? So when the scheme was uncovered, Mercedes accounts had approximately $1.2 million in them. 
And this was between the two accounts at Gelderman and Elders, all right? 1.2 million. So John wanted to leave all of her money on account with Stevens and have Mercedes draw off interest of that until her death. And then when she died, Stevens would collect the balance on the account. Now, John seemed to think that the Stevens, the Stevens brothers would be amiable to this and would be open to this idea because remember, he had grown and formed a pretty like close bond uh, between them, you know? So he he was thinking that he could talk them into this, but uh, the problem was talking Mercedes into it. And she was not, she was not down with this plan at all. Didn't, didn't, didn't want to help. The other plan, was that John would give the Stevens $600,000 in cash and the remainder of Mercedes' estate upon her death. But again, she refused to help out with this as well. Uh, not only did she, you know, refuse to, you know, relinquish her estate, I think John also wanted the $600,000 from her as well. And yeah, Mercedes was just not interested. She was not interested in helping her son out of this predicament. And yeah, this really, this really ticked Johnny off. He was very mad and bitter about this, which again, like I said, man, not saying Mercedes is mother of the year. She kind of sounds maybe like a little bit of a beyond, right? But I mean... You're the one that, that did this, bro. You're you're the one that did illegal stuff and, you know, really slipped in, slipped in it. And, you know, she doesn't have to help you. Should she? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I, I would like to think that I would, you know, help my child in that situation. But yeah, there's just a lot we don't know. So in October, when John's scheme was unraveling and, you know, Mercedes was alerted to what had been going on, she actually sent a letter to Stevens actually accusing them of owing her money. And she had also denied any involvement in her son's scheme. She was, yeah, very outraged and angry that all this had happened behind her back. And a couple of weeks before he committed suicide and before he was fired, John was scrambling with trying to come up with some sort of money. And I guess he went down to like a gun shop or a pawn shop and tried to see how much all of his weapons would get him. He was trying to scrape up any cash that he could. And on November 11th, that's when Stevens were able to assess the damage that that John had, had done, what, what, what the, the total damage was. So when Stevens fired John on November 13th, they told him that unless they received a million dollars in restitution, they were going to take legal action against him. But, you know, because they liked him, they were going to let him just give them a million dollars and yeah, they would not pursue legal action. And John then begged for at least 30 days to be able to come up with the money. And I think they were granting him that 30 days. Now, John planned the murders of his family at least three weeks before he did it. It was discovered that he had voided a will that he had executed in 1985 when he had had his heart surgery, his heart bypass surgery. So he voided that will and replaced it with the handwritten one that was found in the briefcase. And yeah, this new handwritten will made no mention of Christine or his children. And it had been dated November 9th and was signed and notarized by a notary and two witnesses. In this handwritten will, John estimated the net value of his, of his estate at $890,000, leaving half a million of that to his mother, which brought her ca total cash assets to $1.7 million. And in part of his letter to her, he encouraged her to pay off Stevens $700,000, which would leave her a million dollars to live off of and invest. And that same day, November 9th, that he had that handwritten will notarized, he had also called his insurance company, his life insurance company specifically, and asked if his policy had an effective suicide clause. This clause, it was later discovered, gave Mercedes an additional half a million dollars. In, his, in a diary entry, I believe dated the same date, November 9th, he suggested that he was making preparations for what he called option with a question mark. And this led some to wonder if maybe he hadn't firmly decided killing his family until he found out what Stevens was going to say on that meeting on the 13th, where they ultimately fired him. And on that same day that he was fired, the Markles had actually gone to RAO Video and had rented uh, some horror movies for what the girls called their Freddy party, including Nightmare on Elm Street. This was according to a dance teacher. They were telling her about their exciting little horror movie night that they were going to have. And on November 15th, the day before the murders... 
John had walked into the Quapaw Gallery and bought that expensive old man creepy mask made of nightmares. The clerk who helped John would later say that John gave her, quote, an uneasy feeling that something wasn't right. And she also thought it was strange that someone would drop $24 on a Halloween mask and not even try it on first. That came off, that was a little strange to her. She also said that it seemed as if John knew exactly what he was there to buy. He like made a beeline for the mask, picked it up, bought it, and was on his way. Now, though John thought he had made like, you know, all the proper documentation and had, you know, crossed his T's, dotted his I's as far as, you know, divvying up his assets and all that stuff was concerned. There were actually still lots of financial and legal questions that John left behind that were, you know, left unresolved. And it would actually take years and years of litigation for the whole mess to finally work itself out. So a total of eight lawsuits would be filed by Christine's estate, John's estate, Mercedes' estate, estate, and two life insurance companies. Christine's estate sued, arguing that she would have outlived John, which changes the whole chain of inheritance. And they ended up settling with a third of John's estate, as well as settling Christina's $250,000 life insurance policies. And this money went to her surviving sisters. Eventually, all the lawsuits would be settled out of court with a single confidential agreement. So there's not really a whole lot known about it, but we do know a few things. We know three insurance policies on John Markle's life, totaling just over $653,000, were distributed in December of 1988, $549,000 went to John's estate, and Mercedes and John's stepfather, Fletcher, each received $52,000. John's estate also sold the Markle family home and auctioned off a lot of the family assets, So that was finally settled. But the battle between Mercedes and the investment firms, that was still going on. So Stevens was pursuing multiple legal complaints against John's estate, Mercedes' estate, and Gelderman. In out-of-court settlements, Stevens ended up receiving $600,000 from Mercedes' estate and $340,000 from John's. Stevens and Mercedes then jointly sued Gelderman, arguing that John couldn't have done this scheme gotten away with it without assistance from Gelderman's employees. And this was perhaps a reference to John's friend who had worked there. Mercedes wanted $500,000 in damages from Gelderman, plus an additional million, million, my lord, million in, I can't even talk, plus an additional million in punitive damages. And this was for allowing John to set up an account and forge documents like without her notice. But ultimately, a court would dismiss Mercedes' complaints. Stevens was was seeking $6.2 million from Gelderman in compensatory damages, $5.2 million from John's losses, plus a million dollars for commissions paid to Gelderman during that time period. That's where they came up with the 6.2 million figure. And they were also seeking the same amount in punitive damages. Gelderman, you know, they, they, so they did acknowledge that while their employees did have a hand in allowing John to post allocate trades, they also argued that only $854,000 uh, in profits was taken from the Stevens account. And even that small amount could have been prevented if, you know, Stevens had just watched John more thoroughly. So they were kind of throwing that right back in their face, be like, well, you should have been watching your employee. And finally, in 1990, at trial, a jury awarded Stevens actual damages of $1.4 million, plus an additional million in punitive damages. Now, there have been many experts over the decades that have analyzed these murders and tried to posit an explanation, tried to come up with a theory as to why John thought killing his family was the only way out of his predicament. Like, people just didn't get it. It's just like, okay, so maybe you were going to be rough, facing some rough financial times, but so people don't get Like, that's a temporary situation. Like, you would have gotten over it. Some theorize that John thought that maybe he was sparing his family the embarrassment and shame of like his failure, which whatever. Others think that John legitimately believed that his family would be better off dead than without him. I guess that's pretty common in cases of familiacide. And there are some who think that by leaving his assets 
to pay off the debt and leaving everything in his mother's name, that this was simultaneously a way to pay off the debt that he owed Stevens, and also, I guess, give his mother the finger at the same time. Now, like I said, this case had a lot of, like, spooky horror vibes that did make it pretty popular in the press that that did report the story. You know, the fact that he got fired on Friday the 13th, the fact that he got the Halloween mask, the fact that the Nightmare on Elm Street DVD was like in the VCR, and most importantly, the fact that Mercedes had voiced the demon in The Exorcist When you put all these facts together, it, of course, spun this, like, you know, spooky, like, ominous case. And, yeah, that's kind of what made it sort of popular in the press rounds that ran the story. And, yeah, after that, Mercedes just sort of retreated out of the public limelight. I think she may have done some few plays here and there, but, yeah, she was pretty quiet up to this point. There were some photos of her attending John's funeral, But yeah, I think she kind of stayed out of the limelight after that. And on March 2nd, 2004, Mercedes finally died at the age of 85. And yeah, that was the wild, astonishing case of John Markle, who, yeah, butchered his whole family and then blamed his mother for it. And I just, I just don't get it, man. I I just don't get it. Like even worst case scenario, right? Christine would have left him and he probably would have struggled a little bit. Yeah, he probably would have. But again, that's a temporary situation, man, like temporary. And to sit there and kill yourself and, and take your wife and two young, young, babies with you? Like, what are you doing? And then the fact to try to, I almost wonder if it was sort of like a premeditated thing on John's part, that letter to Mercedes, because surely he had to have known that that was going to garner some media attention. You know, it's an actress and her son did this horrible crime and, oh my God, there's there's this letter to his mother. What could it say? You know? I I don't know. I don't know. I, I think John is a very, of course weak little boy who definitely had mommy issues and instead of getting help decided to just yeah make all the wrong decisions yeah so please let me know have you heard of this case before have you ever heard of like mercedes mccambridge i gotta tell you i'd never heard of her i I haven't heard of john's stepfather or father either i think it was just a little bit before my time but please let me know have you heard of this case i had never heard of it so yeah i was pretty floored when i read about it and yeah that will do it for this week thank you so much for spending some time with me and i hope you have a good rest of your week i hope you stay safe and happy out there remember don't be a dick just be a decent person when you go out all right like everyone's struggling all right dude there's just there's no reason to be a douche on top of everything you know just just be a decent person all right i will see you back here next week for another crime dive bye bye